Right, so just a quick note on how these time up. Um, this is the chain kit. Now the diagrams that we get from Autodata or Land Rover are copyright, so they, uh, unfortunately YouTube would throw them straight off if I showed you them. So I've printed it out, I'm sorry, I've drawn it myself. You've got the two camshafts here and here. This is the one that was loose. You've got this intermediate gear and that is one chain. So it's tensioner and two guides. Then the bottom chain, you've got the fuel pump and the crankshaft uh, and three guides, one guide having a timing mark on it. So for the bottom chain, there is no mark on the crankshaft. Now, what this means is you need the tools. You can't really, if it wasn't snapped, you probably would get away with it. But if you want to check it's in time, you need the tools because there's no locating mark on this crankshaft. Uh, so you have to buy all the tools basically because of one component. Uh, because everything else, the guide's got a, got a mark on it, the fuel pump has got a mark on it, and the intermediate gear has got a mark on it to set the timing, all other than the crankshaft. If you was just doing the upper chain and the bottom chain you knew was okay, you could get away without the tools because you've got a mark on the both camshafts and one on the intermediate gear. So this is the kit, uh, as you can see. Uh, you've got two chains. Now, the reason they do two chains on vehicles these days is because the chains are much thinner than they used to be for reasons of efficiency and probably manufacturing costs as well so this intermediate gear here this doesn't drive anything it's just a free gear and the reason that that is there is because it's another stress point to take the stress off the chain if this was one chain it would be under even more stress um, so yeah you've got the timing marks on the fuel pump sprocket you've got the timing mark on the guide and you've got the arrow on the intermediate gear, which goes to this chain, and that's that chain done. And then here, you've got a mark for the upper chain. You've got a mark there, and you've got a mark there. So that is how it times up. There's a couple of extra seals that come with it. There's a crank seal. Uh, there's a special tool to fit that. And once you fit that, you have to leave the vehicle for two to four hours to settle before you start it. And then there's the upper chain cover gasket. Right, so we've got the battery chain out of the way. A uh, bit of deja vu for you all. Just putting all this top bits off. Um, as, as you've seen Rob and Chris do, whip all this off and get to that chain cover.
Well, now we'll turn it back to tray out. Oh, sorry, the gearbox tray out and uh, the cables, and then we can get it up in there. Right, and then that is everything from at the top. The cables are disconnected, um, ready to go, so we'll get it up in the air. Got to take this intercooler off, but all the bolts are much easier to take off from down the bottom. Um, I might just whip these two out here, and then, uh, One yeah, we get problem up. with these vehicles is this, uh, these hub nuts, they always undo, not a problem. But these uh, CV joints seem to be 50-50 in whether they want to come out of the hub, and, uh, you can take the hub off and press them out, but we have seen them get damaged from that. So um, we will give it one attempt. If not, we won't bother taking them out. We'll put the hub nut back in and we'll take the uh, shaft out from the other side. That is actually, so we have got a uh, hydraulic press that goes on here and pushes them, but we're not going to bother, we're going to put that hub nut back in and uh, we will take the, we'll swing the hub out of the way and it shouldn't be a problem. These subframe bolts will be a problem in the future. Steel will wrap off. See the water, rusty water dripping out of those bolts. So in a few years, these guys are really <laughs> to work on. Let's just see the, that's actually coming out. So that is coming out of this bolt hole but on the other side you can see it dripping out so the water is actually collecting in the uh, threads which is which is not good so we will make sure we grease these right up right, before so we this is where the time we want to get our glamorous assistant in to help us pull the stuff down it's a bit fiddly because the uh really, the ball joints are seized in as well which i didn't actually show but we can't take these arms out very well so what we end up doing is just dropping the subframe a couple of inches and then putting the arms out that way. It saves damaging anything or damaging any CV joints. Because the CV joints and wheel bearings are quite reliable on these, so I don't want really to disturb anything I don't need to. So, get the lower arm at one side or the other. Right. These are the easier ones, aren't they, Andy? Yeah. Because uh, we've got a manual gearbox, because those torque converter bolts are a bit fiddly, aren't they? Yeah. And there's no rear diff or prop shaft to keep it hitting us on the head. Exactly I've got... the same as the Jaguar on next Exactly the same as that. Jack, to be honest, you've done more of these than I have. Um, what you, how, how much easier would you say these ones are? A lot easier, because you haven't got to take the transfer box off. It's on the bottom of that landmark over there. You've got a transfer box on there. We'll show you that in a bit, but... Um, yeah, so here we are, subframe off. Uh, this is the intercooler I've got to carry on getting off and then it will be gearbox out. So I'll come and get you in a second. This is the horrible part of the job, isn't it? Getting absolutely covered. I'll just take you underneath here to show you what else we're gonna do. We've got to take the drive shaft bracket out. From there, just there and there. Then pull that shaft out. Uh, and then we are ready to undo all the bell housing bolts, which are the green one that you can see there and there, and then there's various around it. So we'll crack on with that. The uh, chocolate box is optional, but they're nice and clean, so we can get rid of the clean oil in it. Well, obviously, the drive shaft's in it, so we need to go out.
and that's the box out. Then time for the clutch and flywheel, and this is the timing cover behind that. Right, the one thing that is quite important to note is you, sh you cannot be using impact guns to fire off clutches these days. These are self-adjusting. It has a self-adjusting mechanism in it. Uh, this one's not visible, really. It's, it's down there is part of it. Uh, and it, it, what it is, is the where, when the clutch wears, it tries to keep the pedal the same, rather than you used to have clutches that go high. It doesn't really happen as much these days. So it's always vital um, to take these off evenly, crack one, miss one, and then jump on another one. Now there is a tool to reset them. Most of the time you don't need it, but it is vital that you don't crack them off with a gun. You can wind them out with a gun, not a problem um, once they're cracked off, but do not break them free because you can fire that mechanism off. And what will happen is when you put the clutch back in, uh, it goes for installing it as well, uh, you will not have a pedal and the uh, clutch will need to be reset with a special tool. So I'm gonna whip this off and then the flywheel behind that will gun that off, that's not a problem. Um, and we'll what I'm gonna do before putting the flywheel off, that is, that line on that cam is the, um, timing mark so I can't do this while filming Andy could you just come turn this flywheel now the flywheel turns anti-clockwise that is the direction of the engine you don't want to turn that backwards so if you turn that flywheel for me yeah I'll tell you when it's hopefully in line you can hear that bottom chain jumping around I think it's the bottom chain causing the problem on this here it's so bad obviously I don't care if it jumps now because we're not going to be starting it to the new ones on it anyway so we just want to get it vaguely in line. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, you can see that that flywheel's moving before that chain is gone. See the, the play in that. Right, that'll do. That's roughly in the right place. So um, we'll get the the uh, torque bit. I wonder why we're not wearing gloves, but they're just absolutely pointless in these jobs, aren't they? They just rip every two seconds. So we just put barrier cream on instead. Hands sweating them, then they rip, then your hands are filthy anyway, so. Bit of barrier cream and crack on, isn't it? Good to have protection. Lovely, thank you. I'll gun it off. And now we're finally at the uh, the chain cover. There isn't actually any oil in there. That oil is just from where the top covers come off. So quite surprising. There ain't a single oil leak in here. These leak. Actually, there is a tiny weep there, but they leak. There's a new uh, O-ring to go in there. Uh, but same sort of process now, really. You got the three eight mils up here, some tens around here, a bit of wiring to come off, uh, a bracket for that EGR because it needs to come off and uh, these T30s and a crank sensor wire and then we can finally find the timing chain. Right, so, pull this wire and loom out so you can see. certain bits where there's not like a, um, a ceiling surface because you don't want to put dents where it needs to seal. Now being that it's sealant and not a gasket it probably wouldn't matter massively anyway but it is the right way of doing it. Oof, that did not sound good. That did not sound good. I think we have found a problem. The guide is completely disintegrated. Look at that. Wow. So in this case, what we will do, um, we will take the chain off, obviously. We'll do the chain, and then we're gonna put the gearbox back on, and then we're gonna take the sump off, because bits of this guide are gonna be stuck in that sump. Um, so yeah, it has completely destroyed itself. Look at that. That would have been one guide. That is what that should have looked like. Um, but no, that's, that is 
that is pretty shot so I'll just take you off the stand this is going to be a bit difficult. little bit difficult to film um, I'll have to set the camera up somehow to show you the important bit which was this chain now we know that this pulley came loose um, and my theory on why that happens is there's such a vibration through the slack chain that it just basically acts like an impact gun i see i've seen it before i've seen it before happen we've also seen these collapse and fall apart um that's quite common there is a newer one the, the kit that we've got has got the revised one in you have to watch it when you buy um kits on the aftermarket you need to make sure that it's the latest revision which it is um, but my theory is where the chain is jumping around so much um, so obviously this is all turning anti-clockwise so uh, I think my, my theory is once it jumps it pulls it pulls that put cog quite swiftly anti-clockwise and these aren't left hand thread um, obviously they shouldn't need to be but it's just when things get worn out um, also while we're here these are the balance shafts so to change these um, they bolt in this side but you have to take off all this cover here all the crank pulley and everything and uh, that they push out that side and there's a special tool I will show you that um, I will do my best to show you as much as I possibly can in doing this timing chain I think what we will do is let this ramp down slightly with with two of us one in this engine down as we go um, just so I can get a better camera angle and, and get you right into right, so, so show you if these teeth actually go into this pulley, there's cutouts on the teeth. Um, so we're slightly out of time there. There is actually a tiny little mark on the pulley and there's a little triangle literally just there. Oh yeah, let's see if you can see that. Uh, it's this side of the belt though. And then there's it? a little mark there. That tiny little up. line that's meant to line up. So I suppose technically you could risk it without the tools, although I wouldn't recommend it on this. It's probably not worth it. It's such a load of work for not doing it with the proper tools. Unfortunately, these bolt holes are... I should have cleaned them out really, but they're open to the elements, so it always is a bit stiff getting these in. So that's the crank tool in place, and then everything else is done, time and cover end. Um, when you use this, there's a flat piece there, and then a little uh, nub there that goes that way, because this will go in the wrong way, but it does put it out about a tooth, I think, out at a time. So that's the crank locked up, and then we move to the other bit. So this camshaft tool uh, locks the cams in place, not the pulley, and that slots up there. Um, now, I would always advise putting that one in first. I've done it backwards, but I would normally put this one in first because you can then move the crank round to uh, get it in. What I'm going to do is put some grips on this pulley. And the reason I'm going to put some grips on this pulley is we're changing this anyway, so I don't care about marking it or damaging it. Um, but yeah, we'll give that a wiggle. Like so. I'll tell you what, I'll get my assistant. Andy, could you just come and pop this tool in place? Pop this tool. I'm just trying to get this tool in. Just needs pushing down, or do you want to just wiggle that for me? The grips. So I normally would have done it first, but these can be fiddled anyway. So I'll give it a wiggle. Bit more. That's it. Right. And then there is a bolt that locks that out, which is here. Um, sorry, mate. Could you just come and give this a wiggle again? To be honest, even when they, you've got the crank unlocked, this is a nightmare when they've stretched. Um, just the slack between the cams is a pain. There's always slack between these cams when you've uh, done the belt, the chain as well. If you give that a wiggle. There we go. Right, that's dropped in place. If you just hold it there, I'll get the tool.
and that is them cams locked. Thank you, Andy. And this little tool goes over both of the cams. And this can be a bit of a nightmare to fit as well. This one a bit of a wiggle, but that basically locks it off so we can undo these bolts. It just holds it and uh, that is all the timing tools in place now. Um, yeah, when we get the new chain on, you'll see the uh, belt. I can't believe, look how much tension is on that chain. Uh, so lucky. When timing chains snap, they do cause quite a lot of damage. But in our experience, when they jump, they cause more. Because not once the chain snaps, or in this case, obviously, that bolt come out, that cam stops. So there's only one point that, that cam shaft's at. And then it, whatever damage happens is uh, going to be linked you know, just in, in isolated to wherever that camshaft stopped. When they jump out of time, the, the engine can do a full revolution and so can the camshafts and they can just sit there and mash things up. So yeah, very, very lucky with this one. Um, not to have caused more problem because look, that is the noise I can hear. That is absolutely terrible. Uh, and obviously that tension is not gonna be anywhere near long enough to try and take that slack out. So uh, next stage is, is uh, whip these cams off and uh, yeah, and then get all this chain off. But like I say, I'll try and set the camera up and uh, we'll go from there with it. Right, so we're gonna attack this top chain first. Is that loose? That's now loose. So you would have thought that these would have been this, mm, well, yeah, you would have thought that both of these really would have been left-hand thread, especially that one, because obviously it's, it's trying to turn it in the direction to undo this bolt. So you would have thought they would have used the left-hand thread on it, which would have prevented um, what's happened happening. Um, not the guide, obviously, but that bolt coming loose. This is a solenoid for the exhaust cam. It's based on oil pressure. And In the timing cover, there is a solenoid, this electronic solenoid here. That pushes out here, pushes this valve and it activates it. And once oil pressure is built up, that pulley will become free floating and then controlled by oil pressure. So it will uh, advance or retard the exhaust timing, uh, quite common on a lot of vehicles. A lot of them have it on both cams. This one has just got it on one. Um, but yeah, that is a control valve. The bolts seem to be pretty reliable. The valve can be unreliable, but they aren't surprisingly cheap from the dealer. I think they're only about 20 quid. Um, and they can be changed without taking all this off. You can change them with the cover on. So if, if you couldn't, for the sake of 20 quid, I'd be advising every single chain, but uh, to replace it on every single chain. But they're, uh, yeah, it's so simple to do that I don't think it's really worth it. that cover off and get this bolt out bias the tensioner off and then we can just wind it the winding gun. That's that one off, and then let's drop it off. Let's that 
chain out and that sprocket out. That's the upper chain off and uh, you can see how that timing tool works now. You've got the slots. You've got the two slots on the camshafts and they hold them completely in place. Um, and that is how that works. Right, now onto the lower chain. This tensioner off, which we're not obviously reusing. These have a tendency to ping everywhere, so we have to be a bit careful. That's not too bad. You can actually see that this tension has fallen apart as well. The slider has come apart from the actual guide, so that one was pretty knackered. Get this intermediate gear off now. There's obviously a bearing in that, but that's still alright. This guy's always a bit of a pain to get out. So, pull it. Lastly, that fuel pump pulley, that will be quite tight, so we may have to just make up a little tool to get that off because it won't pull, but there is a, there's tools in there to allow a puller to work. Puller just bolts on like so, I'm just using some nail bolts really. You've seen this puller in one of a recent, uh, a previous video on a uh, on the gearbox. And there's that one. And now what's left to do is clean all this surface off, obviously this needs sealant on it. Um, so I'm going to clean all this old sealant off, give it a scotch bright up, clean off the crank pulley and then we'll start putting the components back together and uh, get the covers back on. Get this scotch bright is perfect for this job. scraper. This is an awesome tool for this job, um, made by Sudorf, but this has got, I think it's tungsten or carbon or something, and it just gets the sealant off really well without marking the aluminium. As you can see, this cut straight through. So I always scrape it off with this, then I go over the scotch right. Engine in here, a lot of the times we see quite a lot of oil issues in these engines, and uh, everything just covering up a, a thick, oily mess. 
so uh, it's one of the one of the cleaner ones we've seen. You can see just rubbing it over with a bit of scotch bright. Finish it off lovely and it gives it a nice little key for the new season. Right, so first off, fuel pump gear, slightly tapered, boiling the tooth get it off. What we'll do, we'll leave that loose into the chamber and then we'll tension it up. Right, so talk it up with the chamber on. Um, yeah, pretty easier, not very tight. The nut is not very tight, so second. Not going to cause a problem. We're going to pop this chain on, making sure we get to the arrow with that painted mark. And this dot here for the mark on the crank relief. Let's put that off quickly. The other thing we need to do actually first is put this guy on. The reason being is they've decided Use this guide for one of the uh, timing marks, so we need to make sure that is in line. Because that is the only way you're going to know that crank is lined up. It's a very easy engine to get the uh, timing of the tooth out of here. This one. That would be nine if I said we've never done that before. Now what I'm going to do you can use a tip X pen just to mark which tooth of course it's behind the light but you can see that tip X mark there Torch. when the camera focuses and that's going to be much easier to see the chain when it's lined up so we know that's got to go there that in then we're going to wind this one in and we can see I oh, will get you up close once this is all back together I'll get you up close but they are all lined up and just for the sake of the video I will mark that with tip X and I will paint the tip X dot there. So you can see it. There's one guide on. And now we've just got that final tensioner to put on. Now there is no Loctite on the guide pins and uh, anyone that's sort of familiar with the BMWs will know that the BMWs they do use Loctite but Land Rover don't even though it appears to be the same 
actually the same part to be completely honest and they don't use lock cut Tensor on. What I like to do, I like to get everything up pretty loose. Um, and then when everything's back together, we'll just bar it up and then we'll put the, uh, then we'll pull the pins on the tensioners. So we're going to start the upper chain by putting this pulley on, which we know caused a bit of a problem. We'll line that up. This bolt does have a little bit of lock part on it. And I'm going to wind that in with a gun. do because of course the uh, the plate will go over that but we'll do that in a bit you've got to do it this way because the only way the only way you can get this chain on is by having one of these pulleys off which I'll try and show in a minute Now comes this chain. So, what I'm going to do is do what I did before with the tip X pen. Is I'm going to mark it in white. which is just going to help the assembly. We've got a painted link. There, like I say, I'll show this anyway, but we'll put this painted link on now. That way you can move it around. Goes there, up from there, that one. Lines up like so. And then that is in. And then I'll just pop that, do that guide back up so we don't forget. Loosely. Then the last guide that is important. There's a little ridge in these guides, and it's important that you get. Let's see if I can show you. The focus is locked. So. If you look on this guide, there's ridges, and it's quite easy, believe it or not, to get the chain half on. So you always need to make sure they are locked in. So I just like to get it on and then just slide the guide up. Like so. that 
in loosely. All right, let's move this torch over a little bit. Centre bolt. Back in here. Now, we want to get this tool in place. It's going on now. It's very tight on this pulley, really, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. aspect of this is this tension that goes in. And what we will do is we will torque this one up now. What I like to do now is uh, tighten the guides up and when I tighten the guides up I'll just mark every bolt that I tighten so that I know they're all. Right, so this one is 35 millimetres. The rest of the guides are 25. Just mark that to say that we're done. Like that. And then lastly, let's mark that. Um, now I'm just going to do up these two lids. Now, when you have fitted this chain, you've got to set this tension off. And you do that by pressing the chain in quite hard in the direction of the tensioner. Right, that's that done. I like to get a hand with that. Uh, so that's all the chain on now. Um, I'm just gonna torque that fuel pump pulley up. Now the tensioner is out. So it's not mega tight, so. We should be fine. 
Show you the 80 millimeter needs on this one. That's it. Fire that out, and that is the timing all done. Take off the tripod and show you a bit of a closer view. Alright, so there's the top timing marks. There is a little dot on that pulley which I've covered. Got a dot on that one. That's the top chain done. And then we've got that mark there, which I didn't actually paint, but that goes to that one. The fuel pump has a dot there. And then that guide there, and that is timed. Um, once you've spun this over, all these timing marks will be irrelevant on the chain. The, the links will not line up. Um, you have to do, I think, I think from memory, it's 64 times you have to turn them around normally before they line up again, which obviously we're not going to do, but we are going to spin it over a couple of times. Uh, the plate that goes on top of there, once this is out, we will put that plate on and torque those two because they're the only ones that aren't done. Um, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to get this plate out and then I'm going to get that second plate on here and uh, just paint a line on that to state that that one's torqued, which I'll do now. But that is how you time them up. But it's a shame because if there was another link on, painted link on here, you could just do it all without the tool. But I just, to be fair, it's not worth the risk. You see how much work is involved. It's not worth the risk doing it without the tools. But we'll get this on. And uh, one thing I definitely want to do before we go home is uh, get this rear main sill on and leave that overnight to settle. Um, but I'll explain that as right, we go. And just going to give us a hand getting the sump off. We've ripped all the bolts out. Goes, they are really tight with sealant. Come around that way. I think it's going to go that way, that's it. And the only fiddly bit about this is the dipstick tube. I didn't really want to have to take it all from at the top, but we'll whip this down and uh, show you inside. You see how much uh, crap is in there. All those bits of guide. Plastic bits everywhere. So what we will do, we will take this strain around because you can see that it's not too bad, but it's starting to block up. But on a side note, this is actually a clean engine in it. Very, very clean. A lot of these are so badly uh, gunked up with carbon oil. Um, so yeah, overall, decent little engine, but we'll get this cleaned up. Um, do the same on here with the uh, scraper and scrape all that surface clean. And then we'll clean the sump out and uh, get it back on. You can just see the amount of uh, guide that was all in there and if that was left in there what would happen is the that would all get sucked up by that oil pump and block that strainer and then you'd have oil pressure issues there's no metal in there that we've seen so that's great but it's just all the all the plastic guide so yeah we're going to get this uh carry on with this get it all out and uh I'll use a little scrubber tool which I'll show you in a minute to clean all these surfaces up because it's easier We don't want to do it on the engine because we don't want bits flying everywhere But for the timing cover and this it is acceptable and uh, we'll cut back in when we do So that. this is the little scrubber tool I was on about Very easy little tool to use Soft pad on there And you can see how quickly and effortlessly that cleans that right up um, Ready for you can the see next how thing. nice that cleans up, absolutely lovely. Um, but you can also see how much it spreads everywhere, which is why it's a shame that we can't use it on the engine because all that will be going flying around inside, which is not good. Clean the timing chuck cover up and then we'll get some silicon on this and put it back. Right, so this is the stuff we like to use, it's an L ring Durco. It's not the cheapest stuff, but you get what you pay for. We don't really seem to have any leaks when we use this stuff. 
turn. Don't need to go around the bolts on this one. Some vehicles you do on this one, you don't. And you really don't need loads. It's just to seal the main surfaces. This bit here actually doesn't matter too much. Now again, Andy's just going to come and help us put the sump on. It's the other way, other way around. Yeah, it goes to the first. Get that up and then we'll push it. Push it up. It's quite awkward because that dipstick tube is a bit of a nightmare. That's it. Right, so covers back on and sealed. The other thing uh, on top of the, I'm hoping you can see this, on top of the cover here, the head gasket actually joins in and we just literally wipe our finger along it with a bit of sealant just to give it a bit of extra seal. So, just lightly nip these up. And then it's all the ones around the edge. one that I can't get to which I'll do in a minute and there's one behind which I'll do in a minute but I just wanted to show you there's two windows in here so Land Rover have put two windows uh, and you can actually see the timing mark up there and there is about enough slack so you can check the timing if you was doing something up the top and also this cover which I will whip off you can take the fuel pump off, um, should you ever need to, without taking the gearbox out and without taking all the timing chain off. You can just get through there to get to it and uh, put a tool in the, to hold the uh, pulley in place as you push the pump off. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of thought there. Um, but yeah, then we've just got to put the three bolts back up here and wipe the excess sealant off. And uh, we can start getting the gearbox back in, uh, put, sorry, put the crank seal in, which I'll show you on video, and then we can put the gearbox back in. Right, so this is the uh, crankshaft tool here in two bits. This first bit goes on any of the uh, two file holes. Now one thing to note with this is 
these seals are not rubber, they are PTFE, and there is an absolutely necessity to clean the crankshaft completely off, which I've done. Must make sure it's dry. You do not use any oil, grease, or anything to fit these. They must go on dry. And you've got a plastic tool that comes with, and what that does, that allows you to slide it over onto the, the next tool, like so. And this tool goes on, and you simply wind it in with a socket. There's no torque trigger on this, some of them do have a torque trigger, some don't. Doesn't really matter if you've done it on or not. But I like to do it by hand. And what this does is it makes sure it goes on nice and straight. And you just get it up till it stops. Like so, that's it. Take the tool off. And that is the seal now installed. Um, the you must leave these, you cannot start them straight away, you must leave them. Uh, you will say in the workshop manual it's two or four hours, I'm not bothered because I'm leaving it overnight. Um, but you have to leave them because it slowly shrinks back into to size. Like I said, they're PTFE, they are not rubber. So uh, yeah, you cannot treat them like a rubber seal and put some grease around it and put it on because it will just leak. And you must leave it because if you start that within before the light time, they do leak. Um, Fork on is are pretty bad at it as well. And uh, there are the seals that you need for the caps. So they do come in the kit, or you would buy them, swap them over and get that back in. Right, so just gonna put the fly on. Um, you always have to use a little bit of Loctite on the bolts, and that's for two reasons. One, so they don't come loose, and secondly, um, these bolts go straight through to the crankshaft, so you can imagine that oil can leak through, so a tiny bit of Loctite actually, Loctite actually seals the uh, bolt thread as well to stop leaks. Right, so new crank seal in, um, and then we'll pop the crank pulley back on. This again is a PTFE seal, as it says on it. So again, very clean surface, no grease used whatsoever. And once it's on, you uh, have to leave it for a few hours. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna talk this back up uh, sorry, I'm going to gun this on and then I'm going to put the crank tool back on and that will allow me to torque the pulley bolts up 
and it'll also lock the flywheel so we can up, they can talk the flywheel bolts up as well. You never want to close up the gap on a gearbox with the bolts. So never fully tighten it until it's pushed in. So, right, do you want to give that a wiggle to get it in? Make sure it's all lined up. That's it. Lovely. Lovely. And then. The last one. Right, that's it. Right, buzz all them bolts in and cut back in. Well, we also know this car had a uh, DPF issue. Um, now we know that Rob and Chris have already put some cleaner in, which I think will probably solve it. But while all the subframes off and everything, we can get to uh, everything. What I'm going to do is take this blue injector out, which I've already undone, and I've got an endoscope camera here that we're going to put in and have a look. And the reason for this is these DPFs are notorious for cracking inside. Um, and if it's cracked, then no amount of regenerating it is going to help. Now, it hasn't got the usual fault codes for uh, the uh, cracked DPF because what a lot of manufacturers are doing now in the Euro 6, they've got a low pressure EGR system. And the feed for the EGR is after the DPF, which is a great idea because it helps prevent all the soot getting built up into, uh, into back into the intake manifold and everything. It has got a high pressure on as well. And uh, yeah, the pipe goes all the way along the exhaust and then it goes into the EGR cooler. And there is a filter inside between where you can see the bolts in between this housing, there's a filter that blocks up and it then throws up uh, EGR fault codes and it's not an EGR issue it's just that there's a filter blocked in there I will probably just whip that off to show you with the camera as well but for now I'll uh, get the camera down there and I'll show you the footage right and the boys have just got that side of the DPF off and uh, we'll put it in there and get some footage and uh, no it looked pretty clean in there uh, you can see it's pretty clean. If it was cracked, that would be all black. So you wouldn't normally get soot out the tailpipes on these cars. If they're successively sooty, then you wouldn't. Um, you would suggest that it would suggest that the DPS cracked. Obviously, because this has had cleaner in it, this is starting to push the soot through. So I'm not worried about that. That will probably clean up. So uh, yeah, we'll get it back together and uh, put it on a regen once the chain's done. And I'm sure right, that's all will back be... together. All the subframes back up, the arms are on, steering rack on, everything's torked, so we can ready to let it down and uh, carry right, on. So it's up. all back together. And uh, there's a special tool for the oil filters. I mean, it's, they're pretty standard, but they're all different. 65 mil and 14 flutes. So Kobe's just going to change that. We've just got a genuine filter. We prefer using them. Um, it's just such a better thing to do, especially if there's going to be any warranty claims. At least there's going to be no argument about the quality of it. So I'm going to put the oil filter in and some oil, and we'll see if it's hot. Oil's in it, ready to go. Straight away. God, how much quieter that is. Miles quieter. Definitely very lucky and definitely saved. So what we'll do, we'll get it outside and uh, do that DPF regen. Um, I don't want to run it up too long in here because the, uh, the DPF cleaner that's been put in here, it will start smoking the workshop out. So, but yeah, very, very lucky. Um, yeah, definitely lucky and got one saved. Ready so, uh, this might be a little bit backwards because we filmed this part before we started on this engine but we didn't save it so I'm sort of trying to repeat what we were doing. So we know that this engine has a uh, camshaft issue and one thing we wanted to do was just check a little bit of the health um, on the 
the engine has already started. Uh, so, do you know, because if there was a big problem with it, it's, it's pointless. Uh, so what we're doing is a relative compression test. Now this differs from a standard compression test because we're not actually going to get any figures from the, the engine, any PSI figures. We are just comparing each cylinder to each other. Uh, what this tool does, the Pico here, um, it's going to take a voltage measurement from the battery and as the compression goes up in each cylinder, as the start motor's cranking, the current will go up and the voltage will drop in the battery and it does a calculation and just measures um, between, each, between each cylinders, it will give us the, the highest one at 100% and then all the rest of the figures um, will show up as a percentage of that. Uh, Land Rover state that anything over 10%, 10, uh, 10 uh, sorry, anything under 10% difference between the highest and the lowest is a very healthy engine. Um, so I've got it set up. It's just a very quick test. We haven't had to disconnect anything, all I've, other than the injectors, just to stop the car starting. Other than that, just straight on the battery terminal and it takes, it's such a quick job, it's worth doing. So I'm gonna get Kobe to crank the engine over uh, and I will show you the results on camera. <laughs> There we go. Right, so uh, Land Rover State, anything under 10% is absolutely fine. I'm actually, you might think that's on the lower end, but I think that'll actually be fine once it runs and warms up. I think that'll be absolutely fine. I'm not worried about any damage um, because if one of those valves doesn't seal properly, you it might run fine seemingly, but you might on cranking where there's a lower compression, that's where you'd really see an issue. So the fact that these are all good, um, it, means we would be, be happy to carry on with the chain but obviously because i've deleted the footage by mistake we've actually already done it but i thought you might want to see uh, so that's it that's the car running um just taking it for a brief spin down the road and you can see all the uh white smoke coming out the back that is the dpf cleaner working as the exhaust is going to warm up so i'm going to get the scan tool just check it for fault codes and then we'll get the uh DPF regen on the way. Interestingly, while we are stopped, the uh, message has changed now uh, and it's saying that you can drive it for 40 miles an hour to clean it. So the scan tool has put that command in the uh, in the car. We have got to top the coolant up. Um, so it is doing its thing. So we'll give it a run. Uh, we'll, put, we'll probably just go back and put some coolant in it and then carry out the driven regen. 